Welcome to Bible study here at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. This is the Bible study on Revelation chapter 8. And I am your host, your teacher, whatever you want to call me, Vicar Josh. Um, so, if this is your first video with Revelation or with St. Paul, first of all, welcome. I would encourage you, if this is your first, if you're trying to jump into Revelation here um, and you haven't watched any of the preceding videos, they might be worth your time, especially Revelation 7, which obviously leads into Revelation 8. Um, but we have them all. We have videos, as of the time this is published, we will have videos 1 through 8 up and then 12 through 22. And that's because originally I taught chapter 1 through 11 in person and then coronavirus happened so the rest of the of the book is online and then we had some feedback that people wanted to go back and that's why all these are being produced so um, within the next couple weeks they will all be up revelation chapter 1 all the way through revelation 22 and they will be there for you some other things on saint paul's page if you're not familiar with it you can go you can visit the channel uh, which is in the bottom it's right under this video um, to the left and it's you can go to the channel there's this bible study there are daily devotions with pastor steve there's uh, another bible study called foundations in faith that pastor andrew is leading that's really helpful and it gives you an introduction kind of to what is christianity what does it actually mean to be a christian um so we have that and then there's also live worship services things with the school all, all sorts of incredible stuff check out that channel subscribe to this channel and then you'll get updates on when that stuff comes out all of that is just shameless plugging though and that's not what you're here for you're not here to listen to an advertisement you are here hopefully to learn about revelation 8 so we're going to step into that and we're going to step into that by remembering what revelation 7 had where we're coming from. And in, if you recall, in Revelation 7, we saw the opening of six of the seven seals. And, and the seals were like literal seals used to keep something shut on the scroll that contains God's plan for salvation. And the person opening the scroll is Jesus Christ. And so we see with each of these seals, there's incredible and, and sometimes terrifying things that happen. So that's what we see in Revelation 8. And then as or Revelation 7, excuse me. And then as we step into Revelation 8, we we see the the narrative, the story, the prophecy moving forward from there. So that's what we're going to step into today is a continuation on Revelation 7. Um, and at this point, I would encourage you to grab your Bibles. It's easier to follow along if you have the text in front of you or your Bible on your phone. Um, because you can access it either way. We're going to look at just the first five verses right, right here off the bat. In, again, Revelation 8, starting at verse 1, we have, When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So that's the first five verses here of Revelation 8. And it starts off with this time of silence. It, it almost indicates this kind of intermission in heaven between the first six seals being opened and then the results of the seventh seal. So a question that I posed when I taught this in person was, what what kind of functionality can an extended silence serve? And some things that come up, um, like what causes you to be silent? It could be kind of an awe. When you see something incredible, there's, there's awe. So maybe this silence is just the awe of Christ's coming. It could be a time of reflection for all the things that we just talked about in Revelation 7 and kind of a reflection on, on all the things that take place. Sometimes when, when we're quiet, it's because we're, we're trying to process what just happened. Um, 
This could also just maybe be representative. Silence is, is a restful thing for a lot of people, so it could re be representative of eternal rest. Um, it could also be connected to the silence prior to creation, before everything was created, um, the void as it were, and then it could just be the awe of a Christian before God. So there, there are a lot of different things that we could take this silence as, and I don't think any of them is a bad way to take it. In fact, I don't think all of them would be a bad way to take it. Kind of this this reflection, this awe, this um, this rest, all these incredible things coming together as John is witnessing what God is doing. Um, just my camera a little bit, sorry. So that's kind of, we see this, this half hour of silence. And then we see the seven angels. Um, traditionally, we talk about these as seven archangels. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, there, there's not a lot of biblical um, detail given on archangels or hierarchies of angels, but traditionally these are seven archangels, which are one of the highest orders of angels, again, traditionally, um, so highest servants of God. They are also called, these seven angels are also called holy angels, um, angels of the presence, referring to the presence of God. Um, these could also be the angels of the seven churches. And if you're like, what are the angels of the seven churches? I would encourage you to go and watch Revelation 1, 2, 3, and no, I think just Revelation 1, 2, and 3. Um, and that gives you a little bit of a summary of, not a summary, that gives you a full-on explanation of the angels of the seven churches. Um, here, these seven angels are referenced with a definite article kind of points to this interpretation that these are the same seven angels of the church because it is a known group. The structure of the language here in Greek, which is the language it was originally written in, um, points to these seven angels being some sort of known group, which kind of preferentially points towards it being the angels of the seven churches that we, that we met earlier in Revelation. So, that's kind of some of the background on these seven angels. And then they stand at the altar with a golden censer. He's given much incense to offer. Um, this angel then comes in to prepare the scene. And this incense is representative of the prayers of all of the saints. Um, so for those of you who are unaware, a censer is kind of, it's a, it's a, bowl of sorts. I get, So you fill a censer with incense and then you light a fire and it slowly burns the incense and releases that smoke into the space. And symbolically, it's often connected, especially if you go back into the Old Testament and talk about the, the offerings of incense at the tabernacle in the temple, it's representative of prayers rising to God. So it, it's kind of cool to see that connection here also where the smoke of the incense, the prayers of the saints is rising before God. So he, he fills, he took the censer, he fills it with fire from the altar and throws it on the earth, pours it on the earth. Um, this continues to take place in the second vision, kind of these actions of judgment. And we have fire throughout scripture is frequently representative of God's holiness and his righteousness and his judgment. So all of this kind of symbolism that goes back is it's a reminder that God is the one behind everything that is taking place here. It is for his purpose. It is for his glory. Even when we read about disasters here, and if you're watching this video relatively close to when it's being published, the world right now seems to be filled with disasters, with disease, with pandemic, with, with all sorts of things over the past um if you watch the news, there's always some sort of disaster going on, and it's really powerful for us to remember and to constantly be putting before us that God is behind them, that God is working in the midst of them, that none of this is happening without God's um, permission. It's not happening against his will. So it's really I think, powerful and helpful for us to look for God's working in these terrible things that are happening, um, these really difficult things to deal with and to reconcile with that. And if, if you find something 
that you say, how can God be in control of this? How can God um, be working in this? What I would encourage you is that is a perfect opportunity for you to reach out to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Reach out to your Christian friends and neighbors. Reach out to your pastor. Give him a call. Send him an email. Shoot him a text message. This is the kind of stuff that we we love to talk about um, with you. So that's kind of a side plug. But that's what we see here in it's, th- it's poured on the earth and then there's thunder, there's lightning, there's an earthquake. Um, all of this is going on. And then we step into the seven trumpets and kind of... Uh, the first four of the seven trumpets, and then the rest are in chapter nine, which will be the next video. So um, we're going to read the next, the, the rest of this chapter, starting at verse six. It says, now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets given to them earlier in the chapter, they prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown on the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened. And a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the the three angels are about to blow. There is a lot there. Um, this is a pretty heavy part of the book of Revelation, and it's it's going to get heavier as we continue. So we see these seven trumpets being blown. And this is, again, this is another kind of prophecy in Revelation. And I want to remind you my stance and what I think is, is the best stance to take on Revelation, whether or not these are literal or metaphorical. And that is, we don't know. We don't know. If God wants angels to blow trumpets that cause these these terrible things to happen on the earth, it is fully within his right and within his power to do so. Who am I to tell God that that's not how he wants to work? So, it could be literal. On the flip side, it could be totally metaphorical. God is, you know, throughout Jesus' ministry, throughout the Bible, God uses metaphorical language to get points across. So I don't want to dismiss that this could be metaphorical as well. Um, so that's where I stand on them. So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to uh, engage with them on either side. So as we step through these trumpets, I'm prob- for a lot of them, I'm going to touch on both, whether it's a metaphor, what could it stand for, or if it's literal, what would that look like? So, and anyone who tells you that Revelation is either strictly literal or strictly metaphoric, they're off base because I don't think either of those is really a fair or an honest way to interpret, to read Revelation. So with that, let's get into these first four plagues. These these plagues are all striking the earth, but they're not impacting humanity directly. Uh, and you'll say, well, it talks about people dying and stuff like that. Yes, but it's indirectly. It's uh, the, the plague happens and its impact on the earth is what then impacts humanity. It's not a plague directly on humanity. Uh, for example, um, if a plague kills all the food in the country and then people die, people aren't dying because of the plague. People are dying because there's no food. Now, on the flip side, if a plague were to strike people and then people would die, then the plague is directly impacting humanity. So, It's kind of a a fine distinction, but it's a distinction I'm making. Um, So, let's step into each of these angels individually. We have the first angel who, uh, who, he blows his trumpet and then follows with hail, there, 
it's followed by hail and fire mixed with blood. Um, so as far as the potential metaphor here, potentially this could be symbolic of the effects that warfare has on the world. Um, you have the blood and the hail and the fire being thrown on the earth, the, the earth being burned up, the trees being burned up, all the grass being burned up. Um, this could be hail and a red sky. And what's interesting is this is kind of reflective of one of the plagues of Egypt, which were, that, that was literal historic events, the plagues of Egypt. Those are not metaphors. So that kind of points toward this being maybe more literal um, because this is a way that God has used to express his judgment, to express his power in the past. And a third of everything. So this is disastrous for the capacity of the earth. The results for mankind are going to be disastrous because the earth with less plants, with less uh, less to support it, uh, the population of the earth is, is going to decline as a result. So this is a disastrous event um, that is happening. And then we step into the second angel and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea. This is a ball of fire being thrown into the sea. As a result, creatures are perishing. Again, there is a connection to the plague, the plagues of Egypt, of the sea becoming like blood. Um, again, results for mankind, there's less food, there's less water, the ships are being destroyed, so trade is being impacted. Um, This one, there's not really as much of a metaphorical connection. Um, I'm sure I can make one up, but it, there's not one that's like readily obvious. So we're going to keep walking. Uh, in the third angel, the trumpet is blown and um, a great star falls from heaven and essentially poisons the water. So uh, the water becomes unfit to drink or it's poisoned. Um, in fact, the name that's given to the star is Wormwood and in that region of the world, in the region of the world that the text was written, um, wormwood is actually a herb that is native to that re region of the world that is a bitter poison. Um, it's In Old Testament times, it's a bitter poison, but it's also it's representative of lamentation and sorrow and the reception of God's judgment and punishment. In fact, there are some places in the Old Testament where uh, punishment for certain sins or certain crimes is bitter water. Um, so there's that. And what's interesting here is all of this, it's only a third. And that is, that could be a literal number. That could be also just representative of the reality that in the midst of these plagues, God is, um, he's limiting the extent of the plague. So this is all still within his control and he's kind of, he's holding it back. Um, which is really interesting as we step into this fourth angel where a third of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and their light is darkened. Um, obviously, this... Time out. Sorry. I just want to apologize. I realize that I have the filler word um, and I say it way more than I should, and it's very irritating. But, so I apologize for that. There's only so much I can do about it because it's... Um, there it is again. It's my filler word. Everybody has one. That's mine. And I do my best to limit it, but I've been noticing I've said it a lot in this video, so I apologize for that. Anyway, back to the text. This has a really obvious, this fourth angel and the, and the partial darkness has a really obvious connection to the Egyptian plague of darkness. The difference, of course, being that this is not total. Now, there's no time constraint with this. So it could be until the end of Revelation, there is this partial darkness. And what's interesting is there, there could be a very pretty, a very easy metaphorical connection here to spiritual darkness. This is a display of anger and of judgment. And what's really cool about all of this is all of this is still designed to drive people toward repentance. It's not directly impacting humanity. It is limited in scope. It is it's God trying to get people's attention and driving them toward repentance, which is in line with the entire rest of Revelation because the whole point of Revelation is Jesus redeeming work. And the repentance that comes with that, that is connected with that, God is driving people towards that. So even though we read these plagues and we say, oh, that's terrible, oh, that's horrible, 
God is trying to work repentance even in the midst of this. He's trying to drive people towards salvation, um, which gives us incredible hope even as we read this, that God is working in the midst of this. And then at the end of this chapter, we have an eagle crying and declaring woe to those who live on earth. Um, so we have this in, in these first four. These are kind of natural disasters. In fact, if we walk through all of these, we could we can naturally explain all of these happening. And, and not to say that God's not the one causing them, but we would have a, a natural name for all of these. If there's hail and fire mixed with blood thrown on the earth, we could explain that as a really bad storm. If and the burning, you know, a firestorm actually, or a wildfire going on. The the second trumpet with the great mountain burning with fire that could very easily be explained as oh that's a comet that's an asteroid i'm not a meteorologist i don't know the difference or an astronomer whoever would know the difference as part of their profession i am not one of those but a, a flaming rock from the from space hitting earth that would be a uh, kind of a natural way to label that we have the Again, a great star falling from heaven, that could be a comet that falls and then, you know, metal leaks out into the water, poisoning the water. And then the sun and the, the moon and the stars being struck, that could happen through some natural phenomenon. What I'm trying to say is that all of these are, are within the natural world, plagues happening within the natural world that God is causing. And what this eagle is preparing is warning is there's a transition here. So that's the first four trumpets. The final three trumpets, those are demonic woes. And this is the only earthly creature to speak in the entirety of Revelation. And I want to be very clear, this isn't because of America. You don't see this eagle and think, oh, America. No, no, that's no, that's not what this is about. Okay. It's not. Stop it. This is connected more to the finality of God's judgment. Um, and what is and we see woe repeated three times. That is one woe for each of the scenes to follow. This is a dire warning. This is preparing us for some really tough text that we are going to tackle in the next video on Revelation 9. And that is where we end Revelation 8 is as a warning for what's going to come in Revelation 9. So that is what we have in Revelation 8. Thank you for joining me for this lesson. Again, if you are looking for more, if you are looking for the rest of Revelation, it is on St. Paul's YouTube page. You can check out that playlist. Uh, go ahead. The channel is right there. You can subscribe to the channel. And if this video is helpful, uh, give it a like. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, go ahead and comment. We do watch the comments and I will do my best to respond if you have a question or something like that. So, with that, again, this has been Revelation 8. Looking forward to Revelation 9. Brothers and sisters, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.